Did you realize that all our tech runs on crystals? Whether it's my cell phone or my laptop, my desktop, my uh, TV, the you know even things like the digital scale in my bathroom or the clock next to my uh, next to my bed. Everything we have that's electronics, our cars, it all runs on crystals. Crystals are what power it. Now, most people may not realize this, but if you took the crystals out of all those different electronic devices, they'd all be dead. They wouldn't function. In fact, few people know it, but the harnessing of crystals is what makes semiconductors and our modern tech electronics possible. Now, I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and today we're going to take a deep dive into the the hidden crystals of our technology. We're doing a series on crystals and we're exposing places where people never thought crystals were before. Now, there's a lot of different crystals, different kinds of crystals, and we're gonna go over some of that in our technology, in, you know, in, in this video, but there's one crystal that stands out more than others. We literally produce hundreds and hundreds of tons of this stuff every year to keep building all of our tech devices. You want to know what that crystal looks like? Very few people have ever seen one. Let me show you. And this is it, a silicon crystal. It's kind of a dark gray. It doesn't really look like much, but this is what silicon chips and transistors and diodes are made out of. Now, it's an unusual shape, you know, this rounded coming to a point. It doesn't have to do with any outward crystal shape. It's just that shape because of how it's grown. They're actually grown in a variety of diameters and lengths. And whatever length or diameter they are, they're sliced into discs, like is shown in the front of this photograph. And then on those discs are put whatever design for uh, an integrated circuit or a transistor or whatever that's going to be made out of them. They are generally a, a gray, metallic gray kind of color, as is shown in this picture. The single crystal of silicon is what runs our technology. And slices of those crystals, thin slices, round, are what is the basis for all our IC chips, transistors, diodes, and, and other stuff that photovoltaic cells and solar panels it all runs on that kind of thing. Let's take a closer look on how slices, discs of the silicon crystal are made into the modern electronic units that we depend on every day that are the, the building blocks of all our technology. So the long rods of silicon crystal are sliced into slices, into discs like this, and the discs are polished and then they can etch onto the surface the circuits. Now it's not like one disk equals one circuit. Oh no, the circuits are much smaller than that. And in fact, they etch on there in tiny fashion, the tiny little diodes and transistors and resistors, and they can literally pack one of these chips, a small area with thousands upon thousands of little circuits in there, little logic circuits that will uh, become a, an IC chip. The disk you can see is broken up into little squares. There's quite a few of them. This is actually a disk that was etched into squares to be made into a Pentium CPU from back in the day. Each little circuit chip is then individually cut apart and placed on inside a device that will handle the wiring and uh, set up so that it can become an IC chip. Let me show you an example. The little chip is placed in a package like this and this is an EEPROM. It's a specialized IC chip with a window so that light can reach the silicon chip on the inside but it allows us to look through and see what's happening in there. You can see in the little window that there are little wires that attach to various points on the silicon and each one of those little wires leads to the legs on the outside of the chip package which then connect with the rest of the circuit for whatever device this is made for. 
Perhaps you can see it a little bit better in this example. Someone has literally etched off the top of the plastic cover for this IC chip. And you can see inside the silicon chip and little wires attaching to it. Then each wire leads to one of the leg leads on the outside of the chip. Now if you look at these little wires, it kind of looks like they're gold. And indeed, in a good portion of IC chips, especially older ones, the lead wires that go from the silicon to the outside leg chips that attach into the circuit are indeed gold. Now these single crystals of silicon have to be, be prepared as being exceedingly pure. They have to be very, very pure to be used in the applications that they're used for. We then, in order to make use of them for what we want, we treat them and dope them with different kinds of elements that can make them into, to have different electronic properties. And in fact, uh, these things are even used for photovoltaic cells. Uh, we dope them with boron or phosphorus, sometimes other elements, and we can get various characteristics out of them that we want to have for our semiconductors. The fact that we can make these changes to silicon makes it exceedingly flexible to make all kinds of different devices out of it and why it's the basis for our silicon society, our modern technology that we depend so much on. It's why the silicon crystal is the foundation of our silicon era that makes our lives so much different than my grandfather or his father before him or that sort of thing. It's because this material, and actually silicon is the second most common element in the Earth's crust, second only to oxygen, because silicon can be prepared this way so cheaply and be altered and flexibly changed into so many different things, it makes our whole technology possible. It's the foundation of our modern day electronics and IT revolution. Now, silicon is, like I say, by far the most important, but it's not the only one. There's lots of other things. There's probably the second most important beyond, behind silicon crystals is quartz, just simple quartz. Now, again, now this is a natural quartz crystal that I picked up in Australia when I was there hunting gold. But the, uh, the quartz crystals that are used in our electronics have to be exceedingly pure. And this is a natural quartz crystal. It has impurities, it has flaws. It's not really very good for the, uh, the quartz crystal applications that we need. And well, we might ask, well, why do we use quartz? Why is it so important? Well, it has a really unusual property called piezoelectric, uh, the piezoelectric effect. It, it basically is such a thing that if you put pressure on this quartz, it generates a little bit of electricity. And conversely, if you put electricity on the quartz, it vibrates. And, and so it goes both ways, back and forth. And see, the idea that putting pressure on it can generate a little bit of electricity, something you know, small but can be measured, makes uh, possible things like electronic scales. The bathroom scale I have here at the house, yeah, when I step on it, there's a quartz crystal that gets deformed by the weight of my stepping on the scale. And the heavier I am, the more crystal, uh, the more the crystal gets deformed. Uh, if my granddaughter, who's much smaller than I am, steps on it, it doesn't deform nearly as much because she doesn't weigh nearly as much as I do. And so uh, the amount of electricity that's generated is proportionally measured by the electronics and the, the semiconductors in the digital scale and then transferred and displayed on a digital display that says how many pounds I weigh or how many pounds my granddaughter weighs. All of our scales work there. I have scales that measure gold nuggets. Those worked on the same principle. We have a scale in the kitchen that, um, you know, if you want to measure out a pound of hamburger or something, it measures that. Works on the same principle. That's how a digital scale works. But actually the biggest use of quartz crystals is not to measure weight, 
but to actually count time. Like I said, if you put electricity to it, it will vibrate. And those vibrations are proportional to the amount of electricity. Just like I say, the amount of deformation is proportional to the amount of electricity generated. Well, the amount of electricity input is proportional to the amount of vibration. And what happens is we use that fact to create an oscillator, a quartz crystal oscillator, of which we make billions of those every year, and they're used to control speed in devices. So if I have my computer and it has to display at a certain, or run at a certain megahertz, the quartz crystal oscillator controls how it runs. Let me show you some uh, quartz crystal oscillators and we'll talk a little bit about them. The first thing to know about these crystal oscillators is they come in all sorts of different shapes and size packages. Mostly they're in some sort of metal container like this, but it's also not uncommon to see them in ceramic type uh, containers as well. Here's one that's in a glass package here in the center. You got the metal package ones too, but the glass package one lets you see inside and actually see the little quartz disc crystal that's inside of it. Here's a diagram that lets you see inside what these things look like. And you can see the white quartz crystal disc on the inside with the big electrodes here on the, the left side of the diagram. And that just shows what's inside these things. It's not a very big piece of quartz. It's just a little disc, but that's all it takes to do the job. Now the discs inside the crystal oscillators are very small, but a lot of the quartz is lost during the cutting and fashioning process to make the right size little crystal disc. So we grow huge crystals of this that's sawn up in and cut up into the right size little bits of quartz. And this is the kind of crystal that they grow. And it's literally, we grow these by the thousands of tons every year. We also make a number of other different uh, materials, other different miscellaneous uh, semiconductors using gallium or arsenic and other different uh, materials with semiconducting properties. But they have to be crystals in order to control and, uh, and, and have the exact properties that we want them to have. Again, um, it's important in, in all these semiconductors how much the purity is and we can control if we want impurities to change the properties we add them if we want uh, other impurities to change the property in a different direction we add them so you have to start out with something very pure and then you can add uh, impurities to control the conductivity or other electronic properties that you want to have miscellaneous semiconductors are also made for uh, things like LED lights. Uh, the, an LED light is based on different kinds of semiconductors and different semiconductors uh, that are used for LEDs can generate different shades of light. So whether you want a blue light or a green light or a red light LED, uh, different colors of LEDs can be controlled. Uh, they even have now ultraviolet light LEDs that emit light that's more in the ultraviolet than what we can can really see well. So it all depends on this uh, impurities that you want to control what kind of light or what kind of things you get out of it. And LEDs um, are basically uh, photovoltaic cells in reverse. Just like I said, you can reverse the electricity or deformation or, or vibration in quartz. It's same is can true, true with semiconductors and LEDs. An LED, you put electricity to it and it emits light. Uh, a, a semiconductor photovoltaic cell is the reverse. You put light on it and it emits electricity. So it's, it's the same thing, just in reverse. But we have to control the properties of our semiconductors based on uh, different things, different elements that we add to them to control these different procedures, for these different properties. Uh, lasers, other things are also made as uh, semiconductors. Another uh, high-tech uh, kind of crystal that we use is sapphire. So um, watch faces and stuff can, high-end watches will have uh, a synthetic and man-made sapphire 
Okay, so and we use a sapphire also for lasers. We use it for uh, different sorts of uh, basically windows that have to be high temperature, withstand high temperatures. Um, cameras in space can, you know, because of the temperatures and extremes that they have to endure, often are made with corundum or sapphire. So again, these are crystals and they have to be high purity. We literally make thousands and thousands of tons of these various crystals, the silicon crystals, the quartz crystals, various other miscellaneous um, semiconductors, smaller amounts and smaller amounts of sapphire and that sort of thing for various high tech uses. And all of this is done, you know, they have to be, you can't, you can't really use natural products uh, for quartz crystals. The sapphire obviously isn't, and can be natural. Uh, silicon and other some of these other uh, more uh, exotic semiconductors they don't occur in nature anyway but you can't use natural quartz crystals they have in the past but they're not nearly as good as man-made ones and so we man make all this stuff in factories and the next video I'm going to talk about the factories that produce crystals and the weird processes that they use to put out these crystals now, I'm doing a series on crystals. If you want to take a look at the first one I did that kind of explains crystals and how they form and why they form into the shapes and colors that they do, I'll put a link to that here. And then also, I did one on gold crystals. And gold crystals are just really fascinating, very interesting and rare and unusual. And that's been a real popular video too. And I'll put a link to it here also and in the description, just like I did with the first one in this link. And so I want to say that generally speaking, most of my videos are about geology and gold and prospecting and minerals and gemstones and that sort of thing. And uh, if you want to find out more about prospecting for gold and related stuff, I wrote a book on it called Fistful of Gold. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called Fistful of Gold and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself Fistful of Gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures and that sort of thing. It's not in color but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed and so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal and honestly you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below, but there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos. And, you know, like it and share it if, again, you, you see stuff that you really are excited about. And I'll be coming out with lots more new videos, and so we'll see you again real soon.